Hey guys, welcome to another Now Playing vlog where I talk about some of the games that I've been playing lately. The games in this video have been voted for by my Patreon backers. Sheep and Thief is a family gateway style game where you are building a farmyard, you're collecting sheep, you're creating roads and rivers, and you're doing this by hand drafting cards. So imagine Seven Wonders or Sushi Go, you're picking the cards that you want and then you're all taking it in turns to play a card into your farmyard so you are uh, creating roads, you want them to connect up to the cities for points at the end of the game. You're creating rivers, you just want them to be really long but they can be really hard to place. And you're collecting sheep, a uh, sheep is worth a point so the more sheep you have the better. There's some really interesting decisions here because a lot of the cards you don't want, they're roads that take you in the wrong direction. Or the rivers are really hard to connect up and, and there's often roads that go over rivers that make it even harder to place. And if you can't place a card, then you just effectively don't get anything for that, for that turn. There's also some interesting interaction with the other players because you have the thief or the fox. If you play a card with a fox, you can move the fox token and it moves on everyone else's board at the same time. So if you move the fox and on someone else's board, it moves onto a place with some sheep, you steal those sheep and they go into your pen and they're points for you at the end of the game. So that creates some interesting interaction where you're scared of having sheep in certain parts of the board because they're near where the fox is. And there's also dogs that allow you to herd your sheep so you can move your sheep to safety. I previously owned the Japanese version of the game, which is plays almost identically, is a great game, but just with cheaper and smaller components, a much smaller box, but only comes with paper boards. Uh, in this version, there's cardboard. This version also brings in uh, two extra elements, which I both really like. One is mission objectives. So you might be trying to build the longest river or the longest road or have uh, the most dogs on the board. That's gonna get you points at the end of the game. So that's something to aim for. And then there's also the black sheep. You start with a black sheep um, at the top left hand of your board and you're trying to get the black sheep as far down the board as possible. So the more you can herd it, the more dogs you use to herd that sheep, the more points you'll have at the end of the game. And that's really nice because you can also use the fox to send someone's black sheep back to their top left of the board, costing them quite a lot of points. That's another thing to consider. So there's quite a lot of decisions, but it's really simple on the rules. It's got beautiful artwork, really cute sheep. All the artwork is quite different. I wish that the boards were made out of like a neoprene playmat because they, they only fold once and they just don't sit as flat as you would like. I'm showing actual love to Sheep and Thief. It's a great gateway game, it's simple, it plays quickly, it's got a really cute accessible theme and I just really enjoy it. I've been sent this by Big Potato Games. This is to promote their new game Colorbrain and it's a little game that I'm gonna play right now. So it's asking me what color is the lid on a jar of Marmite? Well, it's yellow. I eat a lot of Marmite. So, aha, okay. Wow, nice. Right, what color is an Oompa Loompa? Well, I think, I would say purple, but with green hair, but it might be green with purple hair. I'm gonna go with purple. Oh, fail. Uh, orange, okay, I wasn't even close. Maybe orange with green hair, okay. What color is a baby swan? Uh, I wanna say gray, but oh, I don't know, that might be a gosling. Okay, okay, sweet, gray. Or silver in this instance. What color is pistachio ice cream? Well, if it's anything like pistachio, I'm gonna say green. Yes. Oh. Now I know how to play Color Brain. Enjoy. Sweet. So yeah, this is a new trivia game where the answers are all colors. So I'm looking forward to trying this one out. Thanks to Big Potato. Covert is a dice placement game with a spy theme from Kane Klenko and Renegade Games. And I was attracted to this game because it's got a beautiful box art and also a brilliant artwork just generally across the game. You're each playing as competing spies in Cold War Europe 
and you are having to complete missions. So you might be trying to get your spies to certain parts of Europe, you're trying to collect certain things, you've got like uh, tape recorders and cameras and lock picks, and you are also cracking codes here and there as well. So you're trying to complete these missions, and I really like that aspect of the game um, because it requires you to, there's a spatial element of moving around the board and trying to collect certain things. You've also got these multi-use cards that either work as the object or they're a plane ticket to move you around the board or they are a uh, special ability. The way the dice placement works is that you use that for certain types of movement but also for picking up missions and completing missions and you roll your dice, you put one down, that means you can do that action later on. And then other people have to place adjacent to where your dice is. So there's certain slots and you won't always be able to place when you want. There's a lot of puzzling to this game. You really have to play your dice at the right time or use certain tokens or abilities to manipulate dice or it, the movement around the board is interesting. How are you gonna complete those missions? And I found it a bit like Pandemic where you've got these multi-use cards. There's a lot of ways to skin the cat but what is the most efficient? How is the best way to do it? At first, I really enjoyed that in Covert. And then I realized what I like about it in Pandemic is that you discuss it together. There's a lot to get your head around and somebody throws in a, a better idea and you're all kind of discussing it together because there's so many different perspectives to see. In Covert, there's so much to think about and you're having to do it all on your own. So it's a game that's very much, you're in your head the whole time. And when I played it with my girlfriend, she wanted to write things down on a bit of paper because there was so many things she wanted to do in that turn in terms of movement and where she should be and how to complete her missions that she just couldn't remember it all. When I've played it with more than two players, also the game goes on too long because people are having to really think about their turn and I don't, even think it's analysis paralysis, it's just wrapping their head around everything. I, I didn't see anyone that didn't kind of struggle with that because there's a lot to think about. I really respect Covert. I think that some people will really enjoy the puzzle and some people probably have the right brain for it and they can, they will just excel. But for me, I spent far too long in my head thinking behind my shield planning it all out and not enough, there wasn't any interaction and the theme doesn't come through that much. Um, and so whilst I I felt like I kind of enjoyed aspects of the, the tactics and the strategy, I didn't feel like I wanted to keep playing the game. Um, so ultimately, yeah, Kova isn't a game for me. Tortuga 1667 is a game that I backed on Kickstarter from Facade Games. And this is a hidden team game where you are playing as pirates and you are either a British pirate or a French pirate and you're moving around ships trying to get the most gold for your team but nobody knows who uh, which team you're on. So in a six player game there will be three British and three French but you don't know who's on your team. So there's two different ships on this wonderful neoprene uh, map that comes with the game and you are moving around the ships and you gain different roles on the ship. The person at the front of the ship is the captain and they can initiate an attack on the Spanish galleon to try and get more gold. But everyone else has to help them with cards. They can't do it on their own. There's also the cabin boy. The cabin boy can shift gold between the hold, the French hold and the English hold in the same ship. So each ship can have a French or English allegiance. And it's how much gold is in the French uh, hold or in the English hold at the end of the game determines which team wins the game. It's a game that implies bluffing, that you want to be pretending a one thing and actually you're another. And I think that's interesting and we definitely had a lot of fun with that. But I find when it's so binary, there, are, there isn't much option or you basically can either just be who you are and uh, and play that through the whole game or you can start off bluffing that you're the team that you're not and then eventually you will have to switch because otherwise your team isn't going to win. There isn't much else, there, there's no other options because there isn't a third role except for in a game where you play with an odd number there's one player who's Dutch and they are trying to get an equal balance between, they want the teams to tie and then the Dutch team will win. Now that scene, we played that once, it seemed to be really hard 
because there's only one of them trying to influence that. Um, but it, it was an interesting uh, way to at least allow you to play with five players and seven players and things like that. So the game plays out with these event cards. There's five different event cards, they're face down. And so your actions can allow you to look at them. They can also allow you to force other people to play event cards and that might negatively affect them. So if you think someone's on your team, you might get them to have a good event card. If you think they're not, you will force them to pick up a bad one. So there's hidden information there and some people will know more about the event cards than others. So that's interesting. Um, and then there's cards that create interesting situations such as a player not being able to get on the ships anymore uh, because there's also the island of Tortuga in the middle and there's a French and English side to that and so there is gold in, in that island and everything is done with voting. So you can vote for the English to have the gold in Tortuga or the French to have the gold but you only have a certain number of cards and you might not have the cards you need to vote the way that you want. There's some really interesting ideas in this game and we enjoyed it. I don't know that it has long, long legs to play it again and again. I don't know that it holds up to kind of like the hidden traitor games of resistance that people pay hundreds of times. So I'm interested to try this one again. I'm not 100% sold on it yet, but I think it has promise. I think it is the sort of game that might get better if you play it with the same group over and over again. Everyone understands what event cards are out there, so then you can bluff about which event cards are there, scare people into not wanting to take certain cards. I think, uh, I like that it's a twist on a classic Hidden Traitor game, and it comes in a beautiful box. So I'm keeping it for now, that's Tortuga 1667. Near and Far is an adventure game with a big storybook that's from Red Raven Games, and this was a big Kickstarter success. And the reason I was drawn to it was because of this big storybook, the idea that you can have these encounters and you get something new every time, you get to experience part of this world. And the storybook is really well written. Throughout this game, you will have certain encounters and you'll maybe meet some characters, you'll have to make decisions, and then you'll get something in return. And unfortunately, that's the only bit I really like about Near and Far. Other than the gorgeous artwork, I just don't like any of the rest of the game. It's, for me, a slightly dull Euro game that doesn't fit the theme. You have to collect resources, gems, food, coins, to complete certain cards that will give you points. And that's it, you just, it's victory points. Like, what does that mean to my character? What does that mean in this world, this fantasy world, victory points? It, um, and so much of what you're doing on your turn isn't the story. You might, in a two hour game, get five bits of story and the rest of your turns are going to the mine to collect coins or gems, or going to the market to trade resources for other resources, or building up your band of travelers just so that you can be more successful in the, in the quests. All I was doing I, the, was just waiting for more story to happen. And I wouldn't have minded if I felt like the wait, the rest of the game fit the theme, but it just didn't to me. It felt so mechanical. And then the stories themselves, they're really well written, but the result of them doesn't feel satisfying either because generally you just get paid back with some resources that made no sense to what just happened. Now, I like a game where a story thing has a real impact on the game that you're playing. So if you make some decision, that's gonna come back to haunt you or it's gonna pay dividends later. In Near and Far, it's so self-contained. And you can do something, you can betray somebody. And th to be fair, there are um, certain story arcs that will you will come back to, you'll keep um, revisiting those kind of quest missions, but it ultimately just still ends up in resources. There's no, because the game is trying to make the most victory points, there is no greater meaning to it. Games that have story aspects that I prefer, like Dead of Winter and This War of Mine, they have a real impact on winning or losing the game. That You make a decision and it's huge for you and it really means something. 
but I also like the rest of the game surrounding those story moments because in those games the story is small. Or in games like Sherlock Holmes Consulting Detective or Time Stories, the story is everything and it's important that you pay attention to it because you're going to learn clues and it's all part of the puzzle. Now, admittedly, those are cooperative games and I feel like, unfortunately, story tends to work better in cooperative games. In Near and Far, it just feels like a side project and I want it to be part of everything. For me, Near and Far is a big pass and it's a shame because the artwork's great. I love the map book where you're playing on different maps each time so there's different worlds you're exploring. There's ideas that I really like but the execution it just doesn't work for me at all. I don't want to sit there and be thinking about a Euro game. I want to be invested into a story. Now I'm not saying that this game shouldn't exist and possibly I came to it with the wrong approach because I should have known that it's a Euro game with some story on the side. Uh, but I'm looking for a game that puts the story at the center and that doesn't have this boring game around it. Those are the games that I've been playing lately. Let me know what you think of them in the comments. And if you want to support Actual LOL, make it grow bigger and better, head over to patreon.com forward slash actual LOL. I'm John Perkis. Thanks for watching.